Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Sean Chuan, Program Coordinator with the Agricultural Research Extension Council of Alberta, or ERICA, will be talking about carbon sequestration on the prairies, a cool solution for the hot planet. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Join us March 13th at noon for a presentation about ferruginous hawks by Dr. Janet Ng, who recently completed her PhD at the University of Alberta. And save the date, March 17th to 23rd is PCAP's Prairie, Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Join us for a week-long webinar yeah. series about the ecological goods and services provided by the native prairie grasslands. To register or find out more about past or upcoming presentations, please visit the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org, and just click, click on Upcoming Events. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, Sask Energy, Trans Canada Corporation, Sask Power, Canada North Environmental Services, and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as our supporting sponsor, Eco-Friendly Sask, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the Agricultural Research Extension Council of Alberta. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. And questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. A bit about today's presenter. Sean is the program coordinator with Erica. He graduated from the University of Alberta in rangeland ecology in 2017. For the past several years, he worked on agroecosystem in Alberta to explore the linkage between land management and ecological function, especially the carbon sequestration in Western Canada. And with that, I will turn it over to Sean. Hey, uh, everyone. Um, so, so, so everyone can hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, okay, great. So, hey everyone. Uh, so, my name is Sean. I'm the program coordinator from Erica, with the Agricultural Research and Extension Council of Alberta. Mm -hmm. So, today is my great honor to be invited and give a short presentation about the carbon sequestration and the climate change. Um, so, firstly, I would like to begin today's presentation by yeah. showing you an undeniable evidence. So, this is the Athabasca Glacier, beautiful and spectacular. Yeah. Cool, One good. of my favorite places to go yeah. in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. However, the problem is the glacier is vanishing now at an astonishing rate of more than five meters a year. So you can tell from this picture, the glacier in 1924, the 1985, and the 2011, the ice sheet has retreated several kilometers and leave a moonscape of gravel and rock behind. And that gives you an indication of how rapidly things are changing and the loss of control. So glaciers are melting, sea levels are rising, forests are dying, and the wildlife is scrambling to keep pace. It has become clear that humans have caused most of the past century's climate change by releasing heat-trapping gases as we powered our modern life. Greenhouse gases levels are higher now than at any time in last 800,000 years. As the Earth moved out of ice ages over the past million years, the global temperatures rose a total of 47 degrees Celsius over about 5,000 years. So in the past century, the temperature has climbed 0.7 degrees Celsius. 
roughly 10 times faster than the average rate of ice age recovery warming. You know, we often call the result global, the result global warming, but it is causing a set of changes to the Earth's climate or the long-term weather pattern that varies from place to place. While many people think of global warming and climate change are interchangeable, scientists are clim use climate change when describing the complex shifts now affecting weather and the climate systems, in part because some areas actually get cooler in sh uh, short term. The impacts of climate change are huge. For example, if the temperature rises two degrees or above, we will see falling crops yields in many developing regions and the rising number of people at risk from famine, with half of the increase in Africa and West Asia. For water, water use, if the global temperature rises two degrees, the mountain glaciers disappear worldwide, as I mentioned before, and in the picture. And maybe one day when we go to Rocky Mountains, we will hear people say this place used to be called as Gathabasca Glacier. If the temperature continuously rises above two degrees, you will see significant changes in water availability, especially in Africa, and the sea level rise threaten major world cities such as New York, London, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. And climate change encompasses not only rising average temperatures, but also extreme weather events, shifting wildlife populations and habitats, rising sea levels, and a range of other impacts. And for the entire ecosystem, if the temperature rises above two degrees, there will be possible onset of a collapse of part or all of the Amazonian rainforest and a large fraction of ecosystems unable to maintain current form and rising intensity of some extreme weather events like storm, forest fire, droughts, flooding, and heat waves, just like what we had here in Alberta and BC in the last couple of years, and eventually some irreversible large-scale shifts in the climate change or in the climate system. There are many factors causes rising temperature. One of the first things scientists concluded is that there are several greenhouse gases responsible for warming, and humans emit them in a variety of ways. Most come from the combustion of fossil fuels in cars, buildings, factories, and the power plant. Carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases. Other contributors, contributors include methane released from landfills, natural gas, and the petroleum industry, and agriculture, especially from the digestive systems of grazing animals. Nitrous oxides from fertilizer, gases used for refrigeration, industrial processes, and the loss of forest that would otherwise store carbon dioxide. Now, the carbon dioxide level has increased to the highest level over the past 800,000 years. Um, so to sum it up, um, the average temperature of Earth is rising at nearly twice the rate it was 100 years ago. This rapid warming trend cannot be explained by natural cycles alone. Scientists have concluded that the only way to explain the pattern is to include the effect of greenhouse gases emitted by humans, and we need to reduce annual global emission to 5 gigapound in long term in order to slow down the process of global warming. And so far, we have talked about the climate change, global warming, and its relation to the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is one of many forms of carbon within this carbon cycle. Carbon cycle, as shown in this picture, picture Carbon moves from one storage reservoir to another through a variety of mechanisms. For example, in the food chain, 
plants move carbon from the atmosphere into the biosphere through photosynthesis. They use energy from the sun to chemically combine carbon dioxide with hydrogen and the nitrogen. Oh, no, sorry, not nitrogen, oxygen from water to create some sugar molecules. Uh, animals that eat plants digest the sugar molecules to get energy for their bodies. Respiration, ex excretion, and decomposition release the carbon back into the atmosphere or soil, continuing the cycle. And in this figure, it shows that there are many factors that control carbon concentrations in the cycle. And the number here shows the average carbon store storage and exchange of the carbon between different pools of carbon. <coughs> The atmosphere stores around 597 or 600 gigatons of carbon, and that's one followed by nine zeros. And the one gigaton is roughly one billion calf. And there are about four tons of that carbon being stored in the terrestrial ecosystem, mostly in the soil. As I mentioned earlier, human activities have a tremendous impact on the carbon cycle. Burning fossil fuels, changing land use, and using limestone to make concrete all transfer significant quantities of carbon into the atmosphere. And on the other side, there are many ways to reduce the carbon being released into the atmosphere. And for example, efficient energy use, such as LED lighting, will reduce heating and cooling energy. Electric car like Tesla, maybe they are quite expensive for now, but this could be an environmentally friendly option. <laughs> Perhaps switching the energy sources will be another option. Renewable energy use has grown much faster than anyone anticipated. Um, such a wind farm, the solar thermal power plant, and nuclear power plant are all good choices. However, one component that, they are, that is often overlooked is agriculture activity, especially in the rangeland. So what if we can store more carbon under the ground in the soil through proper management practice instead of control its emission? This will be a win-win investment. Um, so in the next half of the presentation, I would like to talk about how does rangeland and agriculture play a critical role in mitigating greenhouse gases emission? Um, first, um, if we look at this pie chart of world land uses, about one third of land use or land are agriculture related. That includes rangeland 26, 26% and cropland 11%. So what is rangeland? Rangeland are cultivated land that provides the necessary forage for domestic livestock and wild animals. It's plant community dominated by native species. These lands are um, typically diverse, consisting of, of various desert, grassland, shrubland, forest ecosystem, across a variety of latitudes. Um, so this is one of my favorite picture, taking Orion, Orion District, county of 40 miles, around 80K south of the Madison Heights. So in this picture, this is an 1876 holiday standard windmill that predates 27. So the take home message from this built picture is, we have a long history with managing rangeland and optimizing its productivity. Rangeland management practices include livestock management, prescriptive fire, weed control, seeding, irrigation, in fighting against drought, and the use of fertilizer. Rangelands are often unsuitable, unsuitable for land uses such as direct, 
such as directly on um, directly cultivating agricultural crops due to soil quality and the low rainfall levels. Soils in arid areas typically have less organic matter than the in other ecosystems and the less rainfall means grasses and the shrubs will not grow as tall and that <clears throat> often have deep roots. So therefore, rangelands are largely used for livestock grazing or preserved as part of a conservation program. And they are very sensitive to climate change. And within Canada, rangelands like those found in Great Plains of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba covers a large area. In Alberta alone, there are roughly 9 million hectares, similar in area to Portugal or New Brunswick. These rangelands support a large industry of livestock. The Alberta livestock industry currently has an inventory of 5 million cows and calves, most of which depend on rangeland for forage and contributed around 5 billion Canadian dollars to the economy in farm cash receipts. Um, but there are much more than livestock, such as ecological goods and services that includes clean air and water, biodiversity, open space, cultural heritage. Remember the old windmill? And most importantly, the carbon storage. Rangeland can optimize the carbon storage, but this process is complex. So we need a better qualification method and understanding on this. And we will focus on this in the rest of the presentation. So speaking of the carbon storage, carbon storage is one of the main ecological goods and services that Rangeland offer to us. Ranching and play a significant role in the global carbon cycle because of their vast areas and the high soil carbon intensity. Scientists estimate that soil under ranching land in Western Canada alone can contain up to three ta 300 tons of carbon per hectare within the first meter on the ground, with estimates of perhaps two to three billion tons of carbon within the uncultivated rangeland of Western Canada. So just to give you an idea of how much carbon does rangeland can store, this table shows the comparison of carbon storage between the forest ecosystem and the grassland ecosystem. As I mentioned, the grassland is one of many land types that categorized as rangeland. You can tell that there are more grassland than forest in total area, and that there are more carbon stored in the soil in grassland than forest. So for comparison purposes, the amount of carbon stored under one hectare of rangeland is equivalent to removing approximately 150 cars from the surface of the earth for one year. The amount of carbon stored in the rangeland is largely affected by the management and the land use changes. And studies has, you know, there are many studies that have demonstrated that less than 40% of Alberta rangeland still remain native. And the most of these native plant species have shorter above ground, but have an extensive below ground root network. And this root network that acts as an important storage area for carbon. Also, converting native rangeland to cultivated farmland, tan pasture, or cropland has a potential for larger losses of carbon, mostly due to the mechanical disruption of soil structure, destruction of root and the fungal structure, and the replacement of soil organic matter with chemical substitutes. It is estimated that converting net native rangeland to cultivated farmland re results in typically about 20 to 35% loss of that originally present in the surface at 30 centimeter of that soil within a few years or decades. So keep in mind, it is very, very, very important to avoid the rangeland converting and maintain soil health. 
you know, soil is a, the world's largest and possibly most important treasure that is buried right beneath our feet. Soil holds massive amounts of organic matter, which increases its ability to store and release the nutrients essential for plant growth and enhance the water holding capacity. This means soil organic matter forms the basis of soil health and fertility and so the, for the food production. But it carries an, you know, another crucial function. It captures carbon from the atmosphere as soil organic carbon. Plants fix car organic carbon in soil through decomposition roots and the fluids. Soil microbes um, generally work on this and break down these residues into soil organic matter. Some are naturally released into atmosphere as carbon dioxide. It is when we lose soil organic carbon or the soil organic matter through human activities that we face problem. However, now we see the effects of soil degradation. The degradation of one third of the world's soil has already released up to 100 gigatons of carbon from the topsoil. So it is clear that losing this topsoil would increase carbon emissions and accelerate climate change. So um, just to give you an idea how important the healthy soil is to the entire ecosystem. Here I have, I'm going to show you some pictures. This is the left, the left top one is Earth from the space and the right top one is Mars from the space. You know, the blue planet versus the red planet. What makes this huge difference is not only the thin layer of the atmosphere. If we take a closer look, the bottom left one is Earth and the bottom right one is Mars. What really makes the Earth home is the soil, the soil carbon that being stored. And so speaking of the Mars, if anyone still remembers the movie Mar The Martian in 2016, what Mark Watney did while he was waiting for the rescue, being a botanist, he utilized Martian soil fertilized with the human waste and the water to grow potato. So we can we can tell from this that agriculture will sustain our life and the soil plays a vital role in keeping agriculture sustainable. Unfortunately, if we back to the earth, we have seen some severe degradation of soil in the world. Most soils <clears throat> have lost around 25 to 75 percent of their original carbon pool. And this is why we need to protect it, protect it what we have. And one way we can do it is through the soil carbon sequestration. So what is carbon sequestration? The carbon sequestration is the long-term storage of carbon in soils and the living plants. Through the process of a photosynthesis, plants take the take in atmospheric carbon dioxide and store in the carbon in their living tissue, both above and below ground. Some of this organic carbon becomes part of the soil as plant parts die and decompose, and some is lost back to the atmosphere as the gases, carbon emissions through plant respiration and through the microbes and respiration. Herbaceous rangeland plants contribute to rangeland carbon stores primarily by the growth and the slowing of the roots. The process in the case of a brand new species and especially when grazed. And when such a plant is pruned back, such as with grazing, a roughly equivalent amount of roots dies off because the remaining top growth can no longer uh, photosynthesize enough food to feed the plant entire entire root system. So in this diagram, just give you a sort of idea of the role of sequestration in the terrestrial ecosystem and the soil formation. 
keep in mind that soil formation happens in the top layer, and this layer sustains soil or organisms activities needed to support healthy plant population, which in turn, the healthy and deep rooting encourages root growth and enhances organic carbon in the soil. Maintaining and improving carbon sequestration in rangelands can help significantly in offsetting the rising level of atmospheric carbon that contribute to the climate change. Um, there's an old saying, perhaps some of you might know, sand over clay, money thrown away, clay over sand, money in the hand. So keeping that, keep that in mind, Carbon-rich soil has much stronger resilience against climate change than bare ground soil. So it is important to understand the process of soil degradation. First, you have the native and the healthy soil, and then you start to see depletion of the soil, organic carbon, and nutrients, and the decline in soil structure under unsustainable and improper management practices. Then you lose the soil resilience. The soil can no longer hold water, nutrients, and the carbon. Then there's a decline in ecosystem functions and the services. If this process does not improve, you will see loss of soil biodiversity, disruption of the key processes, such as water holding capacity, soil organic matter form formation, and eventually there's a, there's severe ecological degradation and retrogression. And this process is often irreversible. And if we look at the, the opposite, the questions then become, how can we conserve the soil? How do we keep the valuable carbon from running off our lands? The bottom line here, when you find the degradation conserving the water and the nutrients, then increase in vegetation cover to provide a good canopy for the bare ground. That can improve soil organ organic carbon and nutrient pools to catch more nutrients in the soil with plant root systems. And keep going up. Sorry. You need to enhance soil quality and the ecosystem services functionality so it can increase productivity. Enhancing, enhancing income and creating political sustainability. And only with right policy and the regulation, we can manage the land more sustainably. And remember, landscape and the people are mirror image of one and another. People and the environment are exactly related. When people are poverty striking, desperate and starving, they pass on their suffering to the land. So only with healthy ecosystem and landscape, you can have a good social and political environment. And this is how you can improve soil and the ecosystem and the social resilience. Um, so having that said, we need to create positive carbon budget. This is like a bank account. You deposit more in your account, you will get more benefit, like a balance. A balance has gains and losses. The gains happen by putting biochar, compost, convert crops, and root bias, by bias, plant litter. But remember, there's no single practice that can be universally applied. These applicates have to be soil specific. But in general, goal is to create a positive carbon budget in the soil. And the gains have to be more than losses by erosion, leaching, and respiration. We have to monitor it and make sure the balance is in favor of carbon gains. And if, and if that cannot happen, if your gains are less than losses, then you are having trouble. 
That means manage the farmland soil properly, including avoid rangeland conversion, reduce tillage, avoid overgrazing, and enhance the high biomass re rotation. Well, then enhance soil health, including organic matter, water, water holding capacity, soil microbes, and nutrient cycling. And lastly, this will enhance our rangeland or farmland sustainability and reduce greenhouse gas emission. However, in spite of the fact that carbon plays a key role in soil quality and climate change mitigation, its importance has mostly not been translated into international actions. And this disconnection between the science and the policy era arenas at local, national, and the global levels can only be resolved with an innovative framework that provides a simple and a clear message to all stakeholders. Equating the soil organic carbon with societal prop priorities like growth, income, jobs, and the social welfare. The starting point should be the key cross-cutting role of soil organic carbon toward high-profile prof topics such as food security, environmental sustainability, climate change scenarios, societal development, human well-being, and the bioeconomy. And also, keep this in mind, as I repeat a couple of times, manage the range and work farmland in general is complicated because we have a very complex landscape. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, there is no universal method that can apply to every corner on the earth. It has to be the soil size specific. And there are more than because there are more than three hundred thousand thousand known soil types. And you cannot assume one practice can apply to all soil types. There, there's just no such magic bullet. If you look at this picture as an example, we have perennial grassland, annual cropland, and perennial forage. And each landscape requires different management practice and amount of effort, and it has to be site specific. And as traditional rangeland uses continue to come under pressure from both climate change and the tightening economic margins, development of alternative revenue streams is becoming increasingly necessary for livestock producers. And furthermore, production demands on rangeland will likely increase as global food demand continues to rise, placing additional ecological stresses on climate weakening ecosystem. Urbanization and cropland conversion are also decreasing the area of rangelands at a rapid rate, and especially in the northern Great Plains in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Con Conservation-based incentivization, incentivization methods are increasingly being implemented to combat these th threats to rangelands as they provide an additional mechanism for landowners to retain these areas, namely the eco economic values of ecological goods and services provided by rangeland ecosystems. Soil management practice in ranching and influence these mechanisms and they can bring carbon gains or losses. Since soil organic carbon is highly dynamic, we need to find innovative ways to preserve more carbon by adapting strategies to local conditions. And we need to monitor and report carbon, you know, report changes in soil carbon. And we need to maintain soil organic carbon stocks in vulnerable hotspots. And rangelands are particularly prone to carbon losses. And especially the environment we are living in Canada. And we need to support landowners to implement, implement them. And this is a huge task, but an 
even bigger opportunity. We can enhance resilience to extreme events, and we can restore soil fertility to provide high productivity and the nutrients, food, and preserve terrestrial biodiversity. And by recovering the soils, we can mitigate the climate change. There can be no doubt that joining forces to protect and increase the stocks of carbon in the farmland soil represents a sound investment in fighting the most challenging environment issue of our time, our changing climate. So lastly, um, I want to wrap this presentation with this very famous picture. Perhaps some of you have already seen this one called Pale Blue Dot. It is quoted by Carl Sagan. Um, here, here is what he wrote. We succeeded in taking that picture from deep space. And if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, every human beings who ever lived, lived all their lives. The aggregate of all our joys and the suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and the economic doctrines, every hunter and the foragers, every hero and the coward, every creator and the destroyer of a civilization, every king and a peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and a father, every inventor and explorer, and every teacher of morals, every corruption, every crop politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and a sinner in the history of our, our species lived there on a mode of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. And I mean, this is the only home we have so we have right now. And if we don't protect this pale blue dot, then maybe one day we have to call it pale red dot. So um, that will be my presentation. And for next, um, I guess maybe next 20 or so minutes, I can I'm open to questions. And thank you for your, you know, for participating in this presentation today. Thank you very much, Sean. That was a really interesting presentation and a really nice way to finish off your presentation. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions for Sean, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And there's a question here from a listener named Penny. Um, mm -hmm. Sean, she was wondering if you could please explain the concept of managed fire. Um, so um, first I have to say um, the concept of a managed fire, I mean, I'm not expert in man fire management, but from the courses and from my knowledge, managing the wildfire is um, also a very critical um very critical component in manage the region and man manage the ecosystem. Uh, so fire happen naturally and sometimes also happen you know because the human we you know we we cause some of the fire as well. And to manage the fire and you have to be very careful because it's it all has the pros and the cons. And if you match the fire properly, it will reduce the, the you know, reduce the amount of the fuel being stored in the rangeland, in the ecosystem. And that will put some extra carbon into the land. And of, I mean, of course, you will release some carbon back to, back to the atmosphere. And the fire, as from my understanding, it also will, you know, will <clears throat> to control some of the invasive species and to control the plant species in uh, the community in the rangeland. And that will somehow will provide a health rangeland in long term. Um, but this has to be, I mean, because I'm saying that, I mean, our expertise in the fire management uh, in the ecosystem, but 
um, in, in general, the fire management have to be down to the site specific, just like soil management. And you have to, when you go to the landscape, you have to look at the landscape and, the, and see how the fire will play a role in managing the, you know, managing the landscape and the, to, you know, what's, the, what's your goal if you want to, if you want to, you know, to take out, take out some of these invasive species where you want to put some extra carbon to your farmland. Thank you for that answer. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in from our listeners here. So um, a listener named Marianne, she says, I really like how you've laid this all out, but what I really need is the thing you mentioned in the end, and that is the actions needed to make it happen. What are the concrete actions that we can do to increase carbon in the soil? Okay, so um, there are several ways to you know, to work on the farm and work on the rangeland and then put more carbon into the rangeland. Um, and and first, and here's a rule of thumb. There's no general, um, like, protocols you can use to put more carbon into the soil, you know, universally, because it has to be site-specific when you make your management practice. But in general, there are several things to do. The first is, and always, as always, this is a very important thing to remember is you have to avoid the range and converting, com, you know, avoid converting the range and the native range and to the farmland, to cropland, because whenever you rotate, you convert the range land to the farmland, you are losing soil. You are losing that top soil, which about 30%, even 40% of that carbon. And this will put, and this is a very important part because that will put some extra, will release quite tremendous, like a, a tremendous, tremendous amount of carbon back to the atmosphere. And the second is you, when Tom come to the grazing management, normally people are arguing whether we use a continuous grazing or rotational grazing. They're still working on that, but from my understanding, rotational grazing will always allow you to give your land some you know rest rest time and allow the um, allow the plant growth back, and that will maintain that root system within the land. And this root system, as I mentioned during the presentation, is very important to preserve your carbon in the soil. And the third thing I think the um, the people have to think about is the policy side, because um, from, my understand, from my knowledge, there's no carbon credit for those ranching and ranchers, which is, uh, which is a gap we should we should fill. If we reward those hardworking farmers, ranch, ranchers, to in order to uh, preserve more carbon, we will see some significant changes in land use management and to mitigate the climate change. Thank you for that answer. Um, there's another question here from Penny, I think referring back to the first one, about how um, how does it replace seeding and need for fertilizer? I'm assuming um, she's talking about the um, the managed fire there. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, so the first listener, Penny, um, she would like to know how it replaces seeding and the need for fertilizer, and I believe she's referring to managed fire. Manage fire. Uh, okay, so um, so here I just give you some of my own thoughts. Is replace the seeding and the fertilizer? Well, that probably will be the first couple uh, steps to you know. What, after the fire, you place the seed and the, let the you know then let the seed grow and you have a you know you can have a um, how do you say um bring the plant back to your landscape and apply the fertilizer 
which will help help you to um, help you to grow those uh, plants. Um, but because you know my because I have just I have to admit that my my knowledge and my research field is not really related to seeding and related to the fire management. So. I'm not, not quite sure if I know any of the answer related to th this, but from my guess is if you replace a seed and uh, the fertilizer would definitely will help you to bring the plant back and to, um, how do you say, um, help the succession of your plant community within the land. Thanks for that answer, Sean. I know it's a hard one. Um, a listener yeah. here named um, Joanne says, how can we convey the messages that livestock raised on native prairie is important for conserving the prairie habitat and not in the same category as the other types of livestock production in terms of choosing sustainable food sources? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, so I think the Sometimes we, I guess, in my opinion, we have to look at the big pictures. We have to look at not only in a short term, you know, we 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 we, we supply the food, the, the, the we supply the food within the farmland, but in long term, does this food the food supply system, does the ecosystem within the land use different land use type, does that sustainable enough for our next hundred or several thousand generations. That's the main question. How can we make the agriculture more sustainable and make the rangeland more sustainable by, you know, using cow grazing on the rangeland instead of on the other farm ecosystems, which is, I, I believe, personally, I believe this, we, this is a very important question to think about because if you look at the long term, if we only concern about something that's going to happen in the next couple of decades, we are we are just you are just narrow yourself down to a very pinpoint instead of in a long in, in a big picture how to make the land more sustainable and to provide the carbon sustainable ecosystem to maintain the food, the food supply uh, chain in the future. And the, I think the key message is here is with proper management on the soil, uh, with uh, livestock grazing, the proper um, livestock grazing system within the rangeland, native rangeland, that will secure more carbon and uh, on on the other side, we'll support our uh, food supply, support the agriculture, support all the whole population on the earth. That's a very important thing to think about because without the sustainable, like sustainability in the agriculture, we're pretty much lose everything. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Matthew would like to know, how do you balance the benefits of good range management with the negative impacts of livestock production, especially enteric methane? Um, so uh, I think that's a very interesting question. I, have a, I had a, actually I had a talk with um, some conversation with a research professor some um, not long ago and I think the key point is you have to make the calculation. You have to make the calculation right, um, which means you have to think about how many livestock can the land can your land take. That's the very first question. You don't want to overgraze your land. You know, you calculate the carrying capacity correctly, and the second question will be how much carbon you are going to put in the soil versus how much say methane produced by the livestock and this is a very interesting question is um i think some some professor in states or 
already have the, uh, the equation figured out. So, um, basically, by saying that um, if you have a sustainable number of cows within the land, within a particular land, you don't need to worry about the methane produced by the cows because uh, there are actually more carbon put into the soil than the 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 cows that have been released back to the atmosphere and that's a kind of like guarantee um and 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 I, as i said i i keep saying this this has to be science specific because some land say if you go to medicine heads in the southern opera area those lands are typically drier and uh, and the productivity is much lower than some area near foothills because you always get some rain during the summer and that you have to keep it that in mind because with less uh, plant community within the land, you are intend to put less cows into the in, in grazing your land, comparing to the those area with high productivities like foothills. Okay, our next question is from a listener named Betty, and she would like to know if you can tell us a little bit more about Erica's carbon pasture pilot project and what it will consist of. Okay, great. Um, um, I mean, great to down to this question because um, first the carbon pasture pilot project is going to wrap up in next month. Um, it, it was a great um, project that help us to engage more producers um, because there's always a disconnection Mm, between producer among producers, um, uh, science and the, the policymakers, and for this project, this pilot project, we have engaged uh, nine producers. Initially, ten, but there one dropped out because of the site condition. And basically, for this project, we collect a bunch of uh, baseline information, and we um, collect their information and make to a uh, ex extension and and the engagement materials, including uh, film, uh, a video form, and some case story, some case stories um, form format, and we believe this will help um, producers in Alberta to know more about the car and the carbon. Uh, you know, carbon sequestration, some carbon policy in Canada, and how, what's their role in uh, sustain, sustainable farming, and, and what's their role in mitigating the climate change and, the, and, the re, and reducing the greenhouse gases. And luckily, and talking about how this project will go into the future, uh, what's, the, what's the direction of this project uh, in the next couple of years. Um, and luckily we got a funding from the um, from our, the government of, of Alberta that um, going to um, that will expand the project to up to another two years and we are hoping to um, to engage more producers around 50 additional producers in Alberta and to collect more information from them, and by by the end of the, that project, we're hoping to get some comprehensive uh, engagement materials, which will help the entire ranching community within Carbera, and to fill that gap among those three uh, three groups uh, around the. The producers, the researchers, and the policymakers, and uh, we believe this will be a great project to be um, in the future, and uh, a right project to engage producers in the future. Awesome! That's so interesting. Um, yeah, so we have a question here from a listener named Claudia. Um, could agroforestry being a better option in Alberta improve carbon sequestration versus only using the land for grazing and browsing? Um, 
I mean, that's a good question because due to the, I mean, as I mentioned in this uh, in this slides, um, due to the complex of the landscape, um, sometimes we, if you if you think about the landscape, not only in Alberta but also in Canada or globally, rangeland is not the only land that is used for you know agriculture and it's another only land, land that contribute to the carbon sequestration and mitigating the greenhouse gases if we combine those agroforest land as you mentioned to if you would that can if you would think about some more sustainable protocol to um to preserve, to secure more carbons, that would be a, I would say that would be an even better solution for used as a, you know, use as a browsing, grazing along the land type because, um, as I mentioned, rangeland is, is not the only land type on the planet. And if we can, use the agroforest land to secure more carbon i believe i, I mean i believe there's one uh, at least there's one research at the university of Alberta, um scott chen he did quite a bit of um interesting research in the agro uh, agroforest land um in terms of the in terms of the so uh, the soil carbon sequestration and i think that this will be some very important part. Um, and because um, if you think of the agroforest lands, the forest will provide more canopies or more plant canopy to the land. And that will sustain quite a bit of carbon, not only in the rangeland, but also in the entire ecosystem. So I agree. I mean, if we think about the, the land use, um, browsing and grazing is not the only way and if the, the if the agroforest land can be used as more sustainably, that's for sure that will be a guarantee we can secure more carbon in the soil. Thank you, Sean. Um, it looks like we have one last question here um, from a listener named Mary Ann, and she said, "Do you know of a compost tea application technique for hay fields that would mitigate the loss of the top portions of the plant needed to feed in winter when we have to, when we need to keep base stalks fed in the winter? Um, we are killing off root systems every time we harvest to feed, but surely fungal application remedies are available, just not commonly known or used." Do you have any comments about that? Um, so my comments on that I mean, could be wrong, but that's, that's just some. So for the for the like a hay field, uh, that's one thing I mentioned um, because we're actually we're losing the carbon each uh, every year when we plowing the you know dig the 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 the, 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 the soil, but. The problem, the thing that we, if we can put more carbon there, such as if we can use the bio, I mentioned the bio, biochar compost or some plant litter residue, that will certainly help to sustain more carbon in the soil land, in the in the land type, instead of you know we're actually losing carbon each year just by harvesting the hay field. And then certainly the fungal will be the, the soil microbes. Um, it will it, soil microbe, microbes uh, microbial community community plays a very critical role in um, in preserving and storing carbon and and through the soil uh, sequestration. So definitely, if you can protect some of the soil biodiversity, the soil microbe communities, that certainly will help the land to use, you know, keep more carbon than, you know, them doing nothing. That's just my, my some, of, some of my comments. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions that we have here. So I just want to thank 
thank you again for the really interesting presentation, Sean. Um, I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in today. And just a reminder that when you leave this presentation, there'll be a quick one minute questionnaire that'll pop up. And if our listeners don't mind filling that out, that would be awesome. That helps us keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going um, into the future. And then also check out the PCAP website and click on Native Prairie Speaker Series. And a recording of this webinar will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Um, and enjoy this beautiful winter weather that we're getting. So thank you, everyone. Yep, thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Yeah, you do. Yep, bye.